Hey everyone, so the internet's filled with all sorts of crazy stuff, but there's something about ancient Egypt, and especially the pyramids, just kind of brings the crazy out in people. So this is one of what I'm sure is going to be a few different videos, kind of breaking down, debunking some of the myths and misconceptions about the Egyptian pyramids. Um... Just want to be clear, this is just about Egyptian pyramids in general. I'm going to make a separate video talking about the Great Pyramid of Khufu specifically. So right now, we're just keeping it a little broad. So yeah, let's get started. So first is a myth that you can't radiocarbon date the pyramids. So I kind of get this one. People assume that since the pyramids are made of stone, and stone has no organic material, that you can't date it. But it's not so straightforward. So I'm going to real quick explain what enables scientists to carbon date the pyramids, the limitations of those findings, but why they're still important regardless of those limitations. So basically, what lets them carbon date the pyramids is the fact that inside of the pyramids, the builders use mortar to help them uh, secure the blocks into place. The outer casing stones fit together very precisely. However, under that, they become more irregular. And then the core stones that the builders assumed nobody would ever see left large gaps that needed to be filled by great globs of mortar and stone rubble. Now, trapped in the mortar, in the depths of the pyramid, are chunks of charcoal from the fires to melt down the gypsum mortar. That charcoal from the burnt wood provides all the carbon needed for scientists to radiocarbon date the pyramids. Now, here's the catch. When scientists went to test the samples they collected from numerous old and middle kingdom monuments, they discovered something weird. Although they expected some of the pyramids' dates to be different from what they anticipated, they wound up being different by centuries, and in some cases the carbon samples varied by nearly 200 years within the same monument. In the chart in front of you, I highlighted this very problem with Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare's pyramids. But as you can see, this is a consistent problem within the Old Kingdom and doesn't get back on track until the Middle Kingdom. Now, why could that be? This is where alternate historians and actual historians differ in their approaches. Now, alternate historians would probably see something like this and say, Dear God, everything we know is a lie. Rewrite the history books. Actual historians see an anomaly like this and say, Okay, let's consider what we know about the time period and see if we can find an explanation. The result is what we refer to as the old wood problem, which sounds like something they'd make a pill for, but it's not. Instead, archaeologists figured that during the Old Kingdom, the height of pyramid building, they would have been burning a ton of wood in order to make all of that mortar to build the pyramids. Well, one thing Egypt doesn't have a lot of is trees. Sure, they would have traded for a lot of wood, but that gets pricey. So one thing we know that Egyptians like to do is recycle old building materials. So they likely took a lot of wood from older structures or old stockpiles of wood and burned that. And since carbon dating only tells you when the tree was cut down, not when it was burned, that's why we have the results spanning a few hundred years. Now, when the Middle Kingdom rolls around, and pyramid building is no longer at its peak, and wood is no longer as scarce a commodity, they aren't having to tap into these old wood reserves, so the carbon samples catch up to the dating of the structures. Now, whether you buy into the old wood theory as an adequate explanation of the older carbon samples or not, that's fine. 
I personally think it's a good way to explain the large fluctuation in dates of the carbon samples within the same monument especially, though I'm not adverse to considering redating the Old Kingdom Regnal dates if new evidence appears. The big takeaway, considering the likely audience of this video though, is that these samples conclusively rule out any ancient lost civilization building the pyramids. A 10,000 year old civilization isn't going to burn uh, 4,800 year old wood to make mortar. Next, we have the idea that pyramid building suddenly sprung up from nowhere and then disappeared overnight. I honestly have no idea where this came from. I could do a whole video solely dedicated to this topic, but I'll try to illustrate this as clearly as possible in just a few minutes. We'll start with pre-dynastic and early dynastic times in which nobles and royalty could be buried in these one-story mud brick tombs known as mastabas. You can see in the cross section that the body was buried underground in various burial goods while the rituals and ceremonies were performed in a separate area above ground. Then the third dynasty, we have some experimentation with the step pyramid structure. Here we have Djoser's uh, step pyramid, which if you look at a cross section, you can clearly see the influence of the mastaba. It's basically a series of mastabas stacked on top of each other, and when you look underground, the burial shaft is still structured basically the same as the mastabas, although you can see there's a much more elaborate subterranean network of tunnels at this point. Additionally, the space for rituals has now been moved outside into a mortuary temple, or a pyramid temple as it's called. This is pretty par for the course from here on out. So, so far, the evolution's pretty clear, and it took about 360 years to do that. Not exactly out of nowhere so far. A series of smooth-sided pyramids were attempted and failed after this, gradually improving and building off of the previous design's uh, successes and failures. Once again, showing the pyramid building did not arise overnight. The Maiden Pyramid appears to have been a kind of step pyramid in which they attempted to fill in the gaps and finish with limestone. Clearly did not work out very well. They learned an important lesson with Snefru's Bent Pyramid that they uh, would take to heart at Giza about the importance of a firm foundation as the Bent Pyramid started to settle while being built causing it to crack under its own weight. Uh, modifying the slope at the top was the only way to reduce the stress and keep the pyramid from crumbling. Uh, the issues with structural integrity is also why there are two different entrances uh, to the pyramid. I'm not going to go into the whole long story about that, but it's kind of funny. I'll, I'll provide a link. Um, they finally uh, got it right with the Red Pyramid, the first successful smooth-sided uh, pyramid up to that point. Uh, to pull it off, they maybe played it a little too safe by giving it a shallower slope than necessary, but after the Bent Pyramid catastrophe, I don't blame them for being cautious. So from Djoser's uh, Pyramid to the Red Pyramid, that was about a hundred years and several failed attempts at uh, pyramids. So fast learners, yes. Coming out of nowhere, no. Now, the Great Pyramid is obviously the pinnacle of pyramid building. It's always kind of cracked me up that people use the fact that no one built a taller pyramid after Khufu as evidence that Egyptians lacked the knowledge of pyramid building skills or something like that. It's like you realize that only one person can have the tallest pyramid, right? They couldn't indefinitely build bigger and bigger pyramids forever. That's literally impossible. Now, keep in mind, although Khufu built the tallest pyramid after him, there's a gradual shift away from simply building the tallest pyramid, and instead they start building more elaborate temple complexes. 
Uh, we're going to skip Khufu's first successor, Jedef Ra, because we're not sure what his temple complex might have looked like because it's in such disrepair. Instead, we're going to go to his uh, second successor, um, Khafre. So after Jedefre passes along, we have Khafre, and uh, Khafre builds again at Giza. Jedefre had sconded off to Abu Rawash for some reason. Khafre comes back to Giza, and although he builds a pyramid rivaling his father's in size, puts it on a little bit of higher ground to make it look bigger, um, you can see he's quite focused on building an elaborate temple complex as well, with magnificent statues in the Valley Temple, as well as the famous Great Sphinx uh, next to his Valley Temple, and you have the Sphinx Temple in front of the Great Sphinx. And before I get a bunch of angry comments about yelling at me that the Sphinx wasn't built by Khafre and it's, you know, 12,000 years old, whatever. Just know that's not what this video is about. Save the angry downvotes and comments for my Sphinx video, okay? Minkari makes the most noticeable break with tradition of all the Giza pharaohs. Logically, you'd think he'd want to one-up his predecessors. Khufu had the biggest pyramid, Khafre tries to make his look bigger, plus builds the Sphinx, but Menkare starts to shift away from all that, and instead really focuses on the aesthetic. Although the smallest of the three Giza pyramids, his pyramid actually has decorations on the inside. Carved reliefs, the only one to do so. His sarcophagus was meticulously carved in a similar design as the reliefs of the pyramid. Uh, unfortunately, though, now all we have are sketches of it because it's on the bottom of an ocean. Uh, the sculptures commissioned to decorate his temples are also some of the most finely crafted you'll find in all of ancient Egyptian history. So, Menkare, not the victim of a civilization losing its skills as pyramid builders, no, Menkare is a trendsetter. By the time we get to the 5th dynasty, we'll see uh, some pyramids that admittedly look a bit shoddy, but the decorations and temple complexes are beautiful by comparison. Take a look at the burial chambers of Unas from the 5th dynasty and Teti of the 6th dynasty containing the pyramid texts. You won't find anything like that in the Giza pyramids because all the money and manpower went to construction not decoration. Um, oh, by the way, this is by chance just kind of a bonus uh, debunking the myth that you never find writing in the pyramids. Uh, pyramid text, that's writing right there in the pyramids for you. Uh, back on track. This is Sahura's pyramid complex, second pharaoh of the 5th dynasty, regarded as having some of the most beautiful reliefs of the 5th dynasty. Meanwhile, yeah, the quality of the pyramid suffers, but that's what happens. Limited time and resources, and it needs to get allocated somehow. Priorities have shifted. And eventually, they're going to shift away from pyramid building altogether. Political instability toward the end of the Old Kingdom brings a cease to pyramid building due to lack of funds and manpower, and despite a revival during the Middle Kingdom, people eventually realize that it's just not worth it. They're expensive, and they're super easy targets for grave robbers. By the time pyramid building has ended, well over a hundred pyramids had been built over a thousand years, but ultimately, the impracticality of pyramid building led to its demise, not the sudden disappearance of the ability to build pyramids. We also know the technology or knowledge didn't disappear overnight because we have mathematical papyruses that date to the second intermediate period. Uh, the Moscow and Rhind mathematical papyruses, which contain information about calculating slope and volume for pyramids. So, 
that also kind of debunks this myth. I probably should have just led with that, actually. Next, we're going to tackle the myth that no mummies have ever been found in the pyramids. Mummies have absolutely been discovered inside of the pyramids. I feel like this one survives because people forget that it's not just the Giza pyramids that exist. So well over a hundred pyramids have been discovered in Egypt. The identities of Jedkari Sessi and Neferefra have been confirmed through DNA testing to be uh, from their specific pyramids, while others like Unas and Teti and more still need to be tested. Uh, to be fair, other remains, such as those uh, from Do Djoser's Pyramid and Menkare's, uh, were tested and are not those of those pharaohs uh, but honestly not many mummies are left in pyramids for us to uh, recover and test and the reason for that is the very reason they stopped building pyramids they made easy targets for grave robbers and for some reason skeptics just have a hard time believing that grave robbers would come in loot burial chambers and tombs and destroy bodies the bodies were decorated with jewelry that tomb robbers would want, so they would just come in and hack them up to get to those amulets and jewelry. We actually have testimony from grave robbers admitting to doing this kind of stuff. This is from the Amherst Papyrus, a New Kingdom document. An official is interrogating a grave robber who got busted for robbing a Middle Kingdom tomb. Uh, the grave robber says, quote, We went to rob the tombs, as is our usual habit, and we found the pyramid tomb of King Sobekemsaf and his wife. We opened their sarcophagi and their coffins and found their noble mummy of the king equipped with a sword. Uh, there was a large number of amulets and jewels of gold on his neck, and he wore a headpiece of gold. We collected the gold that we found on the mummy of the god, including the amulets and jewels which were on his neck. We set fire to their coffins. So as you can see, there's a reason that there are not a lot of mummies left. Uh, we're lucky enough that the few that we have found uh, from pyramids, uh, we've been able to identify a few, and hopefully there are more to come. But in the meantime, we are going to rate the myth that no mummies have ever been found in pyramids false. This next one might be a little anticlimactic, but... I've heard it a lot of times on the internet. I've heard people say that the sarcophagi in the Giza pyramids are too small to hold a human. I'm just going to post a chart here of the interior dimensions of the three Giza sarcophagi. Just go ahead, pause the video, read the dimensions, and yeah. We're going to rate this one as false. Go ahead. Last but definitely not least is the myth that there is no evidence linking the pyramids to tombs. So I intentionally left this one for the very end because so much of the other stuff we've talked about throughout this video can be used as evidence to debunk this myth. For example, we can see how the pyramids evolved from mastabas, those one-story tombs, and remained structurally similar for quite a while. There's no reason to think they would have stopped using it as a tomb just because the sides got smoothed. I also mentioned, for example, that the funerary texts, called the pyramid texts, uh, were written inside of burial chambers starting in the 5th dynasty. That would be a weird thing to do in a place that doesn't bury people. This is an excerpt from Spell 217 from the Unas Pyramid. Quote, Ra a tomb, your son comes to you. Unas comes to you. Let him ascend to you. Enfold him in your embrace. This is the son of your body eternally. 
Similar texts are found painted on coffins, burial chambers in the Valley of the Kings, and in the famous Book of the Dead. This makes it pretty clear that pyramids were used as tombs. And I know that some of you just like to look at the Giza pyramids alone, but you can't do that if you want to understand the purpose of the pyramids. That's not how archaeology works. Oh, and don't forget about things like sarcophagi, which are in the burial chambers of the pyramids, including Giza. Mankaris would still be there, but like I said before, it got lost at sea en route to a museum. And don't forget about the fact that, especially with the Giza pyramids, they're in the middle of a friggin' necropolis. And considering we've established with our radiocarbon dating that the pyramids were not built by a long-lost civilization, it makes it makes the most sense that the feature buildings in an acropolis would be tombs. Now, if you'd like a few more supplementary sources, these are just a few examples of ancient Egyptian texts that refer to the pyramids as tombs. In the Abbot Papyrus, the pharaoh Ramses IX sends out an inspection team to investigate reports of tomb robberies. The scribe documents that nine, quote, pyramid tombs of the kings of old are untouched and one is violated and identifies many middle kingdom and intermediate period kings. Uh, although none of these pharaohs were known to have built pyramids, the fact that Egyptians used the term pyramid interchangeably with tomb in their texts reveals the purpose behind the pyramids. In the story of Sinue, a Middle Kingdom folktale, the hero of the story, Sinue, earns such great favor with the pharaoh Sesostris, son and co-regent of Amenhemet, who reinstated pyramid building during the Middle Kingdom, uh, he earns such great favor with Sesostris that the king builds him a pyramid. A section of the story reads, quote, a stone pyramid was built for me in the midst of the pyramids. The masons who built tombs constructed it. A master draftsman designed it. A master sculptor carved in it. The overseers of construction in the necropolis busied themselves with it. All the equipment that is placed in a tomb shaft has supplied. was supplied. Mortuary priests were given me. Uh, a funerary domain was made for me. So this story, once again, shows the role of a pyramid as a tomb in the necropolis. Alright, that's it for now for our myths on uh, the pyramids of Egypt. Video is already running longer than I had intended it to. I'll probably make a follow-up video about more myths about the pyramids of Egypt. If you have some that you would like me to address, uh, put them in the comments. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you disagree with me, I'm sure that you will let me know. If you agree with me and you like the job I'm doing, please like, subscribe, share, whatever. Uh, I would love to get some positive feedback. Thank you. Bye.